I'd try it. <laughs> Didn't you say you like seafood, I'll say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have a lot of fresh seafood. Haven't had too much freshwater fish, so that's mm. um, would be next on my. You're culinary. not missing anything else here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, any day I prefer freshwater fishes over marine fishes. Y um, you prefer freshwater? What? Freshwater and estuarine fishes. Wow. It's the battle of the fishes. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't expect so much seafood diversity. <laughs> Diverse opinions. Very interesting. It's gonna, yeah, I mean, it's it is a wine we get back home. Yeah. So it's different. Yeah. You, you don't get it. I mean, at least here, no. But yes, back home, it's very different. What is your favorite, Elsie? And I'm sure you must get amazing seafood, like in Palau. Just you were saying fresh seafood, right? Yeah, um, I personally really like um, unicorn fish. Oh. Um, they're really good barbecue. My favorite is barbecued or grilled. Put it on the grill, wait for the skin to peel back. Yep, yep. Put show you on, it's game so, over. The meat is really tender. Um, so that would be my favorite. I also like snappers um, fried. And of course, gotta have the tuna, sashimi. Mm. Yeah. So wow. I like those, <laughs> but a lot of different kinds. Mm. And Palau, they actually also eat a really wide variety of um, marine animals besides fish. Um, so there's sea cucumbers, um, sea urchins, um, sea worm, like the little, they're boring worms that bore into Whoa, corals. Really? They eat those as well. I say they because unfortunately, <laughs> maybe I'm not a true Palauan, but <laughs> I haven't developed a taste for those. For the worms. <laughs> for the worms, but um, yeah, it's also a common, commonly eaten food. Um, one of my favorite things that to eat that's not fish is also mangrove clams. Mm. Those are really good as well. Yeah. Wow, really I did tender. try the the mangrove crab in the coconut. Oh, oh yeah, that yeah. was really good. Yeah, that's another common style of cooking is cooking things in um, coconut milk, and it makes it really good, especially fish too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have that also. I think that's a common coastal area thing where coconut yeah. milk is used in preparations. That's mm -hmm. what Renny, crew Renny from mm -hmm. uh, Honduras, was saying the same thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, and what's your favorite fresh? You said fresh or estuarine fish, right? Mm -hmm. Seafood, do you have a particular favorite or a favorite style of preparation? Oh, many. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it also depends on the kind of fish and how fresh it is. So, I mm. mean, and the variety of freshwater and estuarine fishes is tremendous. Mm, right. So, and the, and the preparations don't have to be very complex. They're very simple preparations. And where I come from, the state where I come from, like we are n known for our fish preparations and the freshwater fishes and estuarine fishes. Oh. So, yeah. And then, Jacob, you chimed in earlier. Do you have a favorite um, fish or s seafood in general or t style of preparation? I could eat ahi breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. Every day <laughs> Didn't you have to do that for a while when you were? Was that you telling me a story when we were in the van coming to the ship? Mm -hmm. Someone I had wouldn't. to. Uh, no, that was Zach. Oh, Zach. Okay. All right. They ate tuna so much they got sick of it. Yeah. <laughs> I could never get sick of it. <laughs> Eat it raw. Only way you should eat it. Is there a particular way you like um, to prepare it? Ooh. Well, it's yeah. another one of those Labea shrimps. Yeah. There. And there's that's a, a very intricate pattern on them. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's and just beautiful. a teeny, tiny Pharisees. little sea star. Yeah. Just Aww. <laughs> Can't miss that. No. It looks like a little sugar cookie. It's. I don't, how did that shrimp get in there, honestly? I think that's part of the... Like, could it just leave at any moment? No, 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 no. no. They're associated there, right? with the uh, sh uh, sponges and they reproduce and I think the larvae are carried with the... some. I don't, people, I don't think people have yet figured that out, right. but they're, it's not that they can come in and out. What was that that you saw, Mia? Oh, it was just a teeny tiny star, sea star that looks like a 
Like a little sugar cookie. Ooh, where is two it? of them in there. I only see one. Only lonely shrimp. Now I want some okay. sugar oh, cookies. Go in, please. Thank you. I'm still unsure of what um, eupectylid sponge this is. It has, well, maybe it could be this one. It has the thicker walls and not as knobby structure, but rig Regadrella species, potentially. So Kara, I know you were mentioning earlier that we are at the northwesternmost seamount in the chain right now. And I was actually talking to some of the crew earlier and they said that um, we came just short of passing the international dateline, yeah, um, which actually runs through Papa Namakuakea, a marine national monument. So, if we had passed through, we would have gone. I th I think we would have gone one day back. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. We would have lost it. We were really hoping. Uh, Ren and I were hoping we'd cross that line. Yeah, that would have been. Yeah. But apparently, there might be some technical difficulties uh, crossing that. It's, it's false meridian. It's kind of mm. like a Y2K type where the systems get confused. I don't know yeah. the details, but multiple people mentioned it to me, so. What did you call it? Uh, the False Meridian. False Meridian. Yeah. it's You have 179 on either side. Mm. Yeah, with all the different kinds of data we're taking on the ship, I guess... Is that what you mean? It would get a little, like confuse the system. Yeah. We would have like double data for certain. I'm certain not things. sure what it is, but apparently it just causes problems. Other people have experienced it. I said we should just turn everything off and just <laughs> float over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at this point, I think we're just about halfway through our expedition. And I believe they said now we'll start heading back east and south towards um, back yeah. along the chain. Stop at some sea mounts yeah. along the way and do more dives. Okay, guys, let's see. Are we getting close? We're so close. I'm sorry, Kara, you asked me something before we saw that sponge. Oh, yeah. Um, what is your favorite way of preparing? Um, you said ahi tuna before, right? Yeah. I'm going to put in the last call, hopefully, for the night. Sorry to interrupt you, Jake. <laughs> Bridge nav. Can you add another, and uh, hopefully the last 150, going 230? Thank you. Hmm. All right, everybody at home, you better get your notepads out. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like poke. I love poke. My favorite poke is spicy poke, but mm. I don't, I don't do it how people think you do it. Um, onions, green onions, Japanese mayo, and I don't use sriracha you use kimchi base mm. and that will change oh, your yeah. life yep. totally different taste and then um there is one secret though um i cannot say so <laughs> it's a type no. of pepper that we use on um on guam tomorrow's will get it i don't know if you guys are listening <laughs> use it um and then sesame seed mm. put it on some hot rice Wrap it in some nori. Game over. Kimchi instead of sriracha? Yeah. Kimchi base. Kimchi base. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, you fresh catch on a wall. Your secret is out <laughs> for the world. <laughs> oh, They're yeah. going to come after you. Yeah. Come after me. They're going to lick you. 
<laughs> oh, me unlearning the pigeon words. <laughs> that came out of left field. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, you don't get me looking trash cat. Oh. Jake, can you just explain what? <laughs> Give some context. Um, licking or you know, uh, means like to get beat up. <laughs> gonna give somebody licking, so you're gonna beat them up. Yeah. That or wasabi mayo poke. Mm. That's really good. So the uncle that makes it at KTA Hilo, Poe Nicole, I'm about to hollow you. But if I do feel like cooking it, I will make ahikatsu. Ah, oh, ahikatsu? Yep. Mm. And then just high high temp oil, put it in, and then uh, I like to keep the inside still a little bit red. Mm. I think you should be chef for a day on the ship. Mm. <laughs> ROV pilot dude, just chef for <laughs> one meal so we can you try it. Able, <laughs> you might be able to convince uh, Daniel and Megan to get poke instead of Thai food. When we oh yeah, port. that'd be Ooh. nice. I know exactly where to go. Across <laughs> the street. Across <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the street. Been there we can just, I'm just going to tell them buy a whole fish from the market Ooh. and I can break it down for everybody. I'll do a, uh, we can do a, a like one of those like show. fish demonstrations. Yeah, we can do a demonstration and cut fish. And we can use every part of the fish. I use every single part. Wow. Don't waste anything. Oh yeah, spicy fish head soup. Yeah, mm. that's a fave. I like to make uh, d dashi broth with a uh, collar, or we can grill it. But I like making ramen with that. Is that a bamboo right there? Oh, there you go. <laughs> More coral. I think in Filipino Hans, that soup is called sinigang. Mm, I love sinigang. Right? Fish head soup? Is that right? Is that um, is that sinigang, correct? I think, is like made with like tamarind, I think. It makes it like kind of like a almost sour taste or kind of sour, tangy. Okay, I could be wrong then. I think my grandpa is trying to compete with you, Jacob. He sent me a bunch of pictures of his sushi. <laughs> <laughs> he said black and ahi. Yeah, and black he's and he's sending ahi. me pictures of. Oh my god. Oh. Sorry, Jana's grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> you get more you get, you get more time. You get more time. I'm still perfecting my craft. I think that what we're uh, looking at is a stolen infrared, right? Huh? Okay. Yep. A stolen infrared coral. That's the one with the zigzag pattern. Looks like it. Uh, I think it's one of the. The sclerac. One of the antelope samias. Or the. I think it's. Selena Som. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. collected this earlier. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Those. Or Mandrivora, um, yeah. Yeah. Selena Somilla variabilis. Yeah. Look at the Potentially. jelly. Oh. oh. She thinks it's Mandrivora. Jelly? Was Wait, that? was that a an, a an Atalanta view? It looked um, almost like a octopus. Yeah, I couldn't really tell what it was. It was really fast. <laughs> Okay, I can, uh, thank you. It's actually a Madripora coral. Thank you, Tina and Asako. I'm curious to see the other sample we collected earlier that they said where, um, so I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Solen, Solesmilia. 
episodes on there. Okay, it had the zigzag like the Madripoora, this mm -hmm. one. Okay, so the Madripoora has those zigzag yeah. features. Okay. Are we supposed to take a rock sample near the summit? Solenos milia. Oh. Okay, that makes it easy. I don't Thank think you, we Dina. have any more room for rock. Okay. No, yeah, Val said we're good on rocks. Okay, good. Solenos milia. So, um, Thanks, Dan, Tina. are you are you thinking? 3 a.m. little after off the bottom for like a 50 yeah, right. minute. Roger. Do they want another Niskin at the top? Uh, we could take another one for just a blank Niskin. We have one more left, so that would be useful. Where do you want the last Niskin? Um, near Let's the top before we, yeah. Yeah, before we ascend. Uh, Roger. Thank you. And I have the ship movement. Hopefully it's going to put us right on the, m the money, right on the mark for waypoint seven. for me. That one looks like a snowflake. Yeah, it's really pretty. Like a sugar cookie with some frosting on mm -hmm. it. <laughs> I have a little seafood story to share as well. Um, my uncle actually runs a fish store, and I think the most like delicious seafood I ever tasted was fresh scallops. Oh. I love scallops so much. Yeah. I don't know if I've had them. Where is this scallops? store? <laughs> <laughs> this is back in New York, so <laughs> so far away. If we're ever in New York, Kara. Yeah. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Pagonic Bay scallops. Yeah. Scallops are awesome. Oh, yeah. When I was uh, a young diver in California years ago, we used to eat scallops underwater. Oh, really? Oh. Pop them off the rock, cut them out of the shell, take your regulator out of your mouth, eat the scallop, the fish come and eat all the little bits, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, put your regulator back in your mouth. And Wow. Come up after a dive. The regulator must full. have tasted awesome. It tastes really good, yeah. I, I guess y'all were hungry. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, uh. Couldn't wait to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you said you've never had scallops, Elsie? I don't think I have. Oh. Yeah. Missing out. I think the best seafood I've ever tried though had to be Otoro. Oh, oh yeah. That's the like um, extra fatty tuna, right? Yes, the bluefin. Yeah, mm. I've had that. Expensive. It's, great. it's really Expensive. good. Expensive. Melts in your mouth. Um, as kids, we used to eat Opihi all the time, straight out of the rock. I don't know the English name for it. Do you know, Jacob? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, they're like little cone-shaped things that stick to rocks on oh. the surface. Kind of like 
OP. I don't. Kind of like. Uh, <laughs> Jacob's looking it up. The Hawaiian limpet. <laughs> oh, limpet. limpet. Yeah. It's related. And as kid, to kids, we would just take butter knives butter and knife, like you know. scrape them off the rocks and eat them wow. off the rocks. Crunchy. <laughs> I can't do it now. I. Yeah, don't like them now. But as a kid, we used to eat so much. Wow. Every time I go to the mainland, it's all my friends want. Bring a gallon bag ziplock. No. We don't want to open up any um, searches on the control computers, mate. Sorry. Unless you want to lose control of the vehicle. I think we're going to finally make it to a waypoint. Yay! <laughs> How far are we? We are about 88 meters. Wait, hold on. Not 88. 51 meters away. Wow. Will that be a first for our watch? I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. that old saying, it's not the destination, <laughs> it's the journey. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> we'll probably actually get a little past it because the ship will stop right about on the waypoint and then it, the ROVs will probably keep moving. Extra credit for next time. <laughs> Bonus points. Yeah, speaking of next time, I think we get to skip the afternoon watch, and our next watch will be midnight again. Oh, I don't get to skip it. Except for, oh, except oh. for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll have to bring you cookies. Yeah. yeah. I have some uh, chocolate truffle mochi if Ooh. you want some of that. <laughs> I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> Kira has earned the title of snack queen. <laughs> <laughs> I was so sad the other day. I thought they made butter mochi, but it was just like pound cake. Yeah, butter mochi is really good. It looked exactly mm. like butter mochi. Big Island Hilo, home to the best mochi store ever. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Two ladies' kitchen. Two ladies. Oh, I think I've been there. Oh, I know actually. that place. So, Mia, um, can you kind of tell us what you'll be doing on on that transit to the other seamount that would help? That is going to help prepare us for our next dive. Yeah, so uh, I haven't seen the plans, but I'm assuming it's an area that hasn't been mapped before. So just like with this dive, uh, I was, I kept, uh, there were a couple times where I said, I saw the area, the data coming in, and on the west side of the seamount, it was pretty smooth. And on this side, the east side of the seamount, it looked like it just collapsed. Uh, so I'll be just working with the other navigators, mappers, and getting multi-beam data so we can prepare uh, for the next dive site. So basically you guys give us a picture of um, what the site looks like and then all of the leadership and scientists kind of throw the dart at the board, <laughs> yeah. so to say, and yeah. then we as a team come in and do the exploration on the yeah, ground. Yeah, yeah. So when I say throw darts, it's, it's obviously It is a joke, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's very intentional. We, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's much that goes into it. <laughs> yeah, I overheard some conversations. That's why I knew that there was a bit of a compromise, it seemed, trying to get both Virginia's and Val's 
uh, samples in. Well, thank you for, you know, doing all this prep work so we can have these um, well-planned out dives. Yeah. Derek and Rennie do the hard part. <laughs> All right, I think we are in line with Waypoint 7. Yay! <laughs> I thought it'd be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Expected like a finish line. I know. <laughs> Our expectations were too high. <laughs> <laughs> like a, an octopus garden waiting for us. I know. <laughs> Well, so far we haven't really, or maybe I missed it, um, we didn't really see any evidence of the trawling no. that we were looking for. Yeah, I'm not sure. Did you say something, Hans? No, no. You know, I, I don't know how big the, the wide area, flat area of the GEO is. I don't know that we made it into the majority of that. But no, we certainly didn't see right. evidence on the way up. Right. It's a good so thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not to say it isn't there, but just on our dive, we didn't come upon it. And it also sounds like maybe the substrate that we're looking at wouldn't be, I guess that's some, can't really, not really something we could say, right? Because I think there was historical records of trawling, which is why they were looking at it in the first place. Mm-hmm. All right. Are you guys going to be in a good position to? Yep, yeah, we've got the water sample too to do. Sure. Yeah, if we want to make it a background, is can maybe we could fly up a couple meters off the bottom. Uh, that way we're. Yeah, kind of seeing what's right, we have about around us, here so the we can do that right before coming up. Is that something we've done before, Taylor Ann? Like different niskins at different depths to look at, um, like the different creatures at different uh, water depths, like midwater versus benthic, or, um, or you just mean like a little bit off the bottom? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if that's something we've looked at in particular, but I know um, Meredith has requested that um, every couple of samples we take a background mm -hmm. niskin, um, and then as well as filtering that, we would filter um, purified water that's in the lab mm -hmm. uh, just to get a control. Right. Um, yeah. So that's mostly what the background background is going to be for. Gotcha. Our final views of this unnamed seamount as we complete our sixth dive of this expedition, of the Ala Almoana Kaiuli expedition. And Elsie, I think before you mentioned that quote, um, it's not about the destination, it's the journey, right? That other quote related to it is, it's not 
where you're going, but who you're going with. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thanks to all our excellent team members for another great dive. Yeah, thank you all too. Yeah. I'm going to move uh, 20 meters, 135. 135? Yes, please. Do you know what that round thing is, Supashana? Looks like a dead sponge. Oh, dead sponge. Okay. Uh, so in on the panda bear there. Zoom in on the panda bear. <laughs> is it dead or is it just fuzzy? <laughs> you just never shower. <laughs> What is the clear? That's the actually a s like that is a smaller sponge that's growing on it ah. to settle on it. Okay. It's like a dead demo sponge. There's your little squat lobster. Yes. In the background. Yeah. And there's a crinoid. Oh, looks alive. Okay. It's a demo sponge. It's definitely a demo sponge. Yeah, like. Okay. Do you need me to recalibrate? No. That's okay. Fine. Poke around in the rocks here for a few minutes. Wow. Is that a fly trap anemone in that little crevice? Yeah. Cool. Up a bit. Come. Oh, that's a really interesting urchin there. In the, almost the middle of the screen. Yeah, we left. yeah we had seen one that earlier. earlier yeah. yeah. Right, Do you remember the name of that one? There? I have to look it up. Oh, yeah, Actually, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, maybe it is. I think Roger. Kukui yeah. is awesome and left a little note here. <laughs> ask, ask, yeah, I can't read that. Let me Google it. Or not, let me look at the, gu the guide here. Okay, um, I'm sorry about that. Right. Please. Looks familiar. Awesome, thank you. Yes. Was that urchin we were looking for, mm -hmm. Taylor? Aspidodiadema. 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 A diadema. Diadema. Aspidodiadematidae. Yeah, that's a great view.
Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it was a geodid sponge, right? Oh yeah. Why did I not recognize it here? Did. Thank you, Dina. Okay. No way. The other geodids that I've seen are more like this kind and not so fuzzy. But this is exactly. Probably have about 10 minutes here, so if you see anything you want to zoom on, circle it up there. Okay. And we have a question asking about how we stream. So we have some pretty amazing uh, cameras, custom cameras on the ROV that get this really uh, beautiful and amazing footage. And we also connect with satellites um, that takes what we're seeing um, and brings it to um, the Rhode, University of Rhode Island Inner Space Center. Um, and then that footage again gets um, um, sent over the internet to everyone's homes that are tuning in so um, it's a pretty amazing telepresence system that we use yeah and we're seeing another geoden sponge in the center with a ferret at the background a couple of crinoids Oh, a swimming crinoid. Yeah. yeah, swimming crinoid. Yeah. So cool. Oh. It's friable, that rock. I'll watch the squatty for a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a nice quad lobster reaching out. There's an Ophir right in the background. That falls in, is it? That's a beautiful view of the squat lobster. Yeah. <coughs> there you go. <laughs> your, uh, that could be choice. you. <laughs> yeah. What is this coral that it's on? Uh, it's it's a hydro. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a hydroid. I'm not sure what kind of an hydroid fan it is, but it is a hydroid. Oh, uh, Tina writes. A solandaria like, but probably. Okay. That's it. Didn't we have somebody asking about hydrozoans in the chat? Um, yeah, there was one that was asking about fire coral, which yeah. is a type of hydrozoan, so right? This was another hydrozoan. So, oh, fan. very cool. So that was a hydrozoan. Mm -hmm. Is that an <coughs> is that an eel or? Yeah, it's probably one of those. Uh, uh, just a little. Yeah. The a halosaur. Ha ha halosaurid. Yeah. I was thinking about Aldrovandria. Yeah. Yes. 
And I saw a tiny little pink sea star to the left. <laughs> Pushing a bit more. Kind of reminds me of those sea dragons. No? I was just going to say that. Yeah, You're we're reading the my mind. <laughs> wavelength. <laughs> I was going to say it looks like a little dragon. Aww. The Gyarados? A bit more, so <laughs> shot of head. Moving pretty fast. There's a black something. It's like a fish. Mm -hmm. It's one of those. Uh, I, see I know the shape. Something. Hmm. Closely related to the tripod fishes, but not the tripod fishes. Oh wow. Very small. Okay. I think the ones which have the greenish eye pad. It's in the porch, like. It didn't really look Another like. One. Yeah. Nice pink sea star. Mm -hmm. One last sea star zoom. I know. <laughs> Oh, there's another sea star. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the sea stars that we sampled had um, a mucus coating. Do most of them, or only some of them, have that, or only certain species? But they can be quite mucusy. <laughs> the sea stars, the deeper water ones. A lot of the deeper water. Animals actually have a lot of mucus. It also helps them against bacterial infection, and they have a lot of defensive mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see the picture in Sea Log. Yeah. <sighs> I'll say it for corals, there is even, you know how corals are also mucusy, like shallow water corals? There is even interest in like um, better understanding that mucus because it, um, you know, there's that delicate microbiome. So like looking at for like antibiotics and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. pretty cool. A mucus. PhD student at our lab is doing that right now for his Oh project. yeah? Yeah. Cool. So lately we've been swabbing corals at Honolulu. And um, Are you full wide there? Very hard. So we have it's a reef break with has a first reef, a second reef, and a third reef. And um, we've been picking uh, variety species. Mm. Uh, skin number one has not been fired yet. That's the only yeah. one. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. You're fine. Uh, looks like skin number one is left. We're about three meters off the seabed here. Um, I think maybe a little bit higher would be better if possible. Roger. Five meters? Yeah, sure. I think that that's a good call. I'll take note of that. Five meters.
Niska number one has tripped. And that is sample number 056. Thanks, Dan. Did you uh, 056? Yes, 056. Thank you. All right. We're off the bottom. Mm, I believe that's a WAP. Can you uh, can come uh, clockwise, I believe. Take that half to the wrap up. Mm. Sorry, I always get that backwards. The other clockwise, anti clockwise. Disable your auto heading and uh, start coming up. I'm going to reassign the Bridge staff. Fifty minutes to surface. Just now notice it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're done. You guys don't need to be in here if you don't want to. Still early. <laughs> Give him a call him at 500 meters. Half hour before. Half hour call outs, uh, kind of an industry standard for. What's that? you win <laughs> bragging rights <laughs> I 
Sorry, right, you can start one on how many times I call people by the wrong name. I should just stick to uh, SEF, side left, side right. <laughs> it's right there labeled. I can't, I can't mess that up. <laughs> So for our viewers, a quick update. Um, we are currently ascending, so we uh, just finished our um, observations of this unnamed seamount and are um, heading, the, the ROVs are heading back up to the Nautilus. Um, so we'll probably be ascending for about 30 minutes, I believe, our ROV pilot, Dan, said, um, and keeping an eye out for any midwater creatures uh, that might show up in the meantime. So, hoping for any more um, surprises. But on this dive, we've been so lucky to see some sharks and um, octopi. So, it's been a really amazing dive. And Mia, I just wanted to let you know you had a shout out from your sister um, who said she's been viewing the streams all really? week. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And uh, we had a question from um, the viewers uh, asking kind of for a summary if we found any trawling damage um other fish or cool rocks so we did take all the rock samples we intended so those will be processed um, by uh, val our um, head geologist on board um, we actually did not see um, specific signs of trawling damage in that area um, and just wanted to note that uh, we were only able to explore a very small amount of this um, seamount um, just one ridge, really, out of this larger um, seamount formation. So um, we can't definitively say anything right now, but um, at least in our video, um, it looked like there was not um, evidence of um, marks from uh, previous trawling. Um, and then fish-wise, we saw lots of different um, types of eel, uh, like cusk eels, um, halosaurs, and um, lots of different kinds oh, of I hit some key there. fish, yeah. so it was a really, really amazing dive, and stay tuned for any um, highlights. There's uh, accidentally discovered a couple keys here, I forget what they do. I don't know, F something. I might have hit, I might hit it, uh, it's also. Um, 
we had a question about. Yeah, I like your full screen. Oh, excuse me. Um, we had a question about. Uh, no. Oh, maybe a squid over there. You can if you want. I don't care. Any particular cool midwater stories? Um, so there was a highlight in the past about um, a sperm whale that actually You're um, just gonna hit two edges and that's it. So came into the camera view. So um, that was Bam, pretty Bam. amazing sight and uh, something they recorded. So if you want to check out that highlight, um, it's on YouTube. Um, Sebastian is joining us from the other watch um, because Taylor Ann, I believe, had to go down to the lab, right, to start um, the whole process of, you know, handling all the samples. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm Taylor Ann. <laughs> um, yes, I did relieve Taylor Ann so that she can go down to prep our wet lab for ROV's arrival on the surface so that we can operate as fast as possible to collect any biological samples and start preserving them so that we can get the proper documentation, the photos, measurements that we need so that scientists ashore can, when they finally look at these organisms on the mainland, can actually get an idea of what they look like when we freshly pull them out of the ocean without them having deteriorated in or changed in any sample preservation techniques. Right, yeah, we definitely want to preserve them in the most, the state that they were most um, similar to when they were in, in the deep ocean. Um, and related to that, um, you have been on a previous Nautilus expedition, right, before this? Ages ago, yes, <laughs> in Do you 2013. Have, yeah, do you have any cool midwater stories? So that was one of the questions um, from our chat was, any cool midwater sightings, but I actually, this is my first cruise, so, um, and this is our first time ascending as a watch, so. Um, from what I can remember, I, one time we did rise above a hydrothermal vent, so wow. we did see some increase in, like, different jellies and whatnot in the water column because of the, there's, like, a nutrient factor about plumes that certain animals can get certain nutrients they need in the water column above it so there's sometimes it can be different animals up there but it was primarily some different jellies we had a scientist aboard i believe that wanted to collect them and had a specialized tool set on the on hercules to collect some of them but i don't remember the exact details of like specific moments in the water for me Oh, that is so awesome. So your first cruise on Nautilus was to the hydrothermal vents? Yep, the Von Dam, hydro, ah, the Von Dam hydrothermal vents um, in the mid Cayman Rise. Wow. Some of the deeper hydrothermal vents recorded. The deepest hydrothermal vent was, I think, literally less than a mile away, the BB hydrothermal vents. But that was like a thousand more meters below us. So we were mm. too, it wasn't too deep for her to make the dive. Wow. That is so amazing. I definitely want to hear more hydrothermal vent stories later. <laughs> yeah, and you can actually still see those highlights on the live right. page. They are still there if you want to go see them. The on the hydro vent, we had all, also a lot of serrate octopuses appearing mm. there. Those ones were a bit more different. They're a bit more slimmer and more orange, I believe. There's a highlight for that as well. And the hydrothermal vents were just covered in creamy Karis hybiza albinocarid trips um, that were completely here. blind and no. relied solely on chemosynthetic symbi symbionts living inside of them. Wow. So it's a really cool shot because when you get to the top of the hydrothermal vent, you can't even see it because it's just a cloud of these trips. Oh my gosh. I definitely want to check that out later. Yeah. What year was that again? Um, 2013. 2013, okay. I think it was like... We were still in like the early like numbers of I think it was like zero, like NA zero three four or something like that. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Wow, one of the early earlier expeditions of um, Nautilus. There yep. was something just swimming in the water, something slender. <laughs> cool. I think we're catching 
some of the dial vertical migration on their way down or possibly oh, starting to yeah. get ready to head down. But there's still likely a lot of them are avoiding us just because how loud and bright we are. Right. Um, Derek on my watch says that you can see the deep scattering layer in with their mm -hmm. mapping and their acoustics and see how it opens up for us as they go down because they're wow, constantly avoiding us. Really? Interesting. Can you help explain for our viewers who may not be familiar with um, dial migration and the um, deep, deep scattering layer, just like a simple rundown of what that means? Yeah, of course. So at night, when uh, the sun goes down, it becomes, the shallow waters become a lot more safer for, pre for, for prey to move around at the surface. So you see a, just a general migration of deeper organisms to the surface to more nutrient-rich waters. So they take advantage of that at night because it's technically a lot more safer from predators. Um, for the prey? Yep, oh, yeah. for prey, yes. But there are some predators that have learned that and kind of specialize to train themselves to go during dry vertical migration to hunt during that time as well, but not as many predators. Mm -hmm. um, but when the sun rises or starts to rise, they, kind of, they have an internal clock that tells them like, oh, I should probably start heading back down so, mm -hmm. so that I can avoid being caught. Um, so they do that general migration. And that trend has been observed all over the world. And so that right. makes it the largest migration yeah. in the world of That's organisms awesome. across the board. Um, in terms of the deep, sea scat the deep scattering layer is where the densest of the pelagic organisms are in the ocean at any given time and that generally changes with dial burrow migration as it goes up and down in the water crop throughout the day wow so cool to have these like massive patterns of um, animal movement that's amazing so they could have some bioluminescence or even stir up phosphorescence at night couldn't they absolutely there's many that do um, because i think we saw these i used to sail when i was young with my dad on dark nights far out at sea and then we saw these glowing patches and it's a little disorienting before you know we knew what they were <laughs> or at least for me <laughs> but i was very young right <laughs> so it's very mysterious it's a little mysterious to see these glowing patches coming up out of the ocean yeah, for the surface ones, it's less likely to be um, pelagic fishes or bioluminescent deep sea animals, and more likely to be um, bioluminescent dinoflagellates that are mm -hmm. being stimulated by wave action. Yeah, yeah. Which is so really cool. So if there is like a rich area of that, you know, if we turn the lights off on the ROVs right now, if we were in a rich area for that, we um, might be able to see that. If we're in a very rich area. Um, from I understand, the, the ROV's cameras may not be sensitive to pick up enough to pick uh, up some bioluminescence. Oh yeah. So it'd have to be a pretty dense, powerful, powerful yeah. organism that are pro producing that bioluminescence. Mm. Yeah. Um, as Abshana has is saying, um, she. She's saying that we also would be scaring off a lot of these organisms before they can even bioluminesce right. in the first place just because of our noise. Mm. So there's organisms that can bioluminesce, but there's also the... Uh, plankton? The plankton, right? which yeah. will be phosphorescent, or I don't know if that's the right word, if you um, stir it up. Phosphorus is a proper term, I think. You can use it as well. Okay. Um, phosphorescent also yeah, works. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, there because are. Because waves crashing at night on the beach in dark nights, you can see it, or the 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 wake from the propeller, mm -hmm. or even the keel of a sloop on dark nights. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's an adaptation yeah. that is very interesting because most of these dinoflagellates supposedly have the burglar alarm effect. So the burglar alarm hypothesis is that. A lot of these organisms bioluminesce when touched because they are trying to signal a predator to eat their predator. Mm. So it's something you also see reflected in deep sea organisms as well. An example would be the Atiola jellyfish, which um, bioluminesces with this very spectacular display. Mm. Um, and it's what happens is it does that and it hopes to attract a bigger predator to eat what's ever bothering it. Um, so. It's actually the method that was used to catch the first footage of Architutus doe, the giant squid. Oh. Um, 
So Edith Witter used a biomimicry robot that had a similar display to Atiola that would just periodically in the water column go off with a trap camera. And she was able to collect pictures of various deep sea predators coming to wow. check out the camera and including giant squids, which was the first photographed imagery of the giant squid. That is amazing. It is natural environment. I'm gonna definitely have to check out that study later. Who who did you say it was from? Um, it was Edith Witter. Edith Wither, okay. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, I've been lucky enough to see bioluminescence myself, um, not from animals, but from plankton. And it was pretty amazing. Like, um, uh, this was in Georgia, and there was like a really strong tidal flow. So the water was just rushing past the stock. And if you put your hand in it, it just like would leave this trail of sparkles in the water. It was so beautiful. And then we got really excited so we got a plankton net <laughs> and we were like let's go explore like what's in this plankton um, and uh, we put the net out and what we totally didn't expect was um, if you just gently tap the line of that net leading out um, it would the whole net would light up because like they're responsive to any kind of motion right or stimulation so um, it, that was so amazing this the big net just like flashing in the darkness so really really cool that's one definitely one of my best like ocean memories and plankton plankton memories i guess <laughs> yeah um there's actually like i haven't done it personally but if you go to washington state to meet sound they oh. actually have certain times of the year in certain parts of the sound you can just take a canoe out there and everything's glowing wow. and you can even see the movement of other animals in the wow. water because of how blue bioluminescent oh, yeah. it is. That's amazing. Oh, we've seen the, the outlines of whales moving wow. under the boat. Here, Passing under the boat. Here, where you currently live in Hawaii or you, are you no, talking about the no, sound no. also? Y years ago, sailing with my dad. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I think there's also another place in um, maybe Puerto Rico that has a really high concentration and you can also like kayak there and um, like put your hand in the water and like see that those dinoflagellates and that you can actually um, I don't know if they're still offering it but um, I once got something called a dino pet uh, have you heard of that before <laughs> it was like um, basically a plastic container um, and you would culture the algae, the dinoflagellates in it, and there was like a nutrient solution. So then you could just keep it at home, and you know, at nighttime you could shake it and then see them glow. So um, that was pretty cool. I, I got one of those with my own money once to <laughs> show a, a class I was teaching. Um, but the challenging thing about it was you had to flip the time schedule. So I had to get like a plant light um, to like. Uh, adjust those dinoflagellates to glow during the daytime and keep them in the dark and then put them in the plant light during the night. So, but it's cool. A nice little plankton culturing project. <laughs> I did not think they had those when I was yeah. growing up. We had the sea monkeys. Oh, sea monkeys, <laughs> fun! <laughs> did you grow a lot of sea monkeys? Uh, I've, I've grown one or two. One or just one or two? Yeah, like tanks. Okay, <laughs> I'm like just one sea monkey is so tiny. Yeah, yeah. I think I did more. Um, I had more like the starting kind of a regular like brine shrimp, which are the more common name for sea monkeys. Right. Um, for feeding for my saltwater tank when I have oh one. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I must have cultured like millions of brine shrimp for yeah. tanks at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the once you get like amount of commitment to the saltwater aquarium over time yeah. is exponential. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, definitely spent a lot of days scrubbing tanks and vacuuming up fish poop, <laughs> stuff like that, in the lab. Uh, my brother just spontaneously started his journey to get saltwater aquarium, like oh, with no yeah. pre or previous aquarium keeping experience. So it's definitely been a learning curve for him, but luckily he has yeah. marine scientists as a brother to give him basic direction. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Is he using Instant Ocean to make his saltwater mix, or? Um, no, I've been advising him to go to the actual um, professional leaf stores to actually oh. get his DI water and salt mix and wow. like any pre-mixed salt water. Mm. Yeah, 
Um, I know we used to use Instant Ocean in our lab a lot, um, and like I would, I definitely feel like I inhaled probably like more Instant Ocean than like OSHA <laughs> regulations <laughs> <laughs> should allow. <laughs> Is there something you're particularly um, excited to look at from these samples, Sebastian? Were, were you able to take any on your watch? Um, there's a couple small ones. Uh, it seems like you guys, the other two ships this time, kind of, but carried the bulk of the sampling for us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just generally excited to see biology in general. Yeah. Um, last three guys have been in the relatively bio-free in terms of sampling and observ observation, so I'm just really excited to yeah, yeah. handle some biology. <laughs> what was your favorite thing about this particular seamount? Oh, um, my favorite thing, well, favorite thing particularly about the seamount, or my favorite thing I saw? Um, like what you saw during this dive, yeah. Um, we saw, my favorite was that we saw a bobtail um, snipe eel just hanging out in the water column. Whoa, well, the water column, yeah, the water column in sight and it just hanged out pretty calmly. Ooh, can you say that again? Bobtail? Bobtail snipe eel. Snipe eel. Okay. So they have these um, specialized beaks on their mouths that kind of curve out. Mm. Um, like think like you're taking some string cheese and it's like cutting it down the middle <laughs> and how it falls <laughs> that analogy, way. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of like for the viewers at home to understand. Yeah. It kind of like that but solid. They have these specialized beaks that have like almost like Velcro like feels to Ooh. their beaks. And what they do is they hunt um, particularly suggested shrimp in the water column. So suggested shrimp are the shrimp you would see swimming around occasionally here on the cameras. Mm. Those usually those red ones with the long antennae. Okay. Yeah. Um, what they do is that they kind of hang out in the water column and try to get these shrimp's antennae entangled on its beak. Mm -hmm. And once it gets entangled, it can just like kind of flick itself and flick the strip into its place and just eat it. Ooh. Yeah. What a... Good what technique. A, yeah. <laughs> so it allows their prey to not escape once they get trapped. And we actually saw it in the water column kind of hanging out vertically wow. so that its beak was just facing down, its head was facing down. So I think it was just waiting for a suggested strip to get accidentally caught in it. Wow, I had no idea about that. That's so cool. What was Snipe unusual, people. though, yeah. was that there are only two genera of snipe eels. Mm -hmm. And to my understand, there's only one snipe eel that's kind of like exists worldwide that is in the Pacific. Uh -huh. But this one that we saw did not match that description. Oh. Yeah, because okay. the one that's commonly seen is a dark brown, while ours was pretty bright red. Wow. So I'm kind of curious if what we're looking at was a new species or not, or right. if I have just not dug, dug enough into the literature, but mm. we'll know soon enough. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, that must have looked so striking then, the red color on the blue background. Really cool. Yeah, some more stuff floating by on the camera. Sounds good. Yeah, the, the mid-water, um, as we arise, um, ascend slowly, also kind of reminds me of um, when you're like scuba diving and you're doing your safety stop <laughs> and you want to go up a little slowly at a time. Um, I know you mentioned, Hans, that you had dive, have been diving for 50 years, right? Is there yep. anything you've seen during your safety stop that was really um, memorable? Uh, you know, I've done several types of diving, some, you know, sport diving, commercial diving, science diving, and 
Yeah, yeah, deco stops are just hangs. You can spend some time. We used to eat grapes at, at some of the deco stops, you know, get kind of thirsty. Oh, like like fruit grapes, not yeah. sea grapes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you can eat grapes. Midwater diving can be disorienting, frankly. I mean, it's there are no references. I mean, if you're diving over the bottom with invisibility and doing a, a midwater decompression stop, it's pretty simple to watch your depth gauge and hang in one spot. But open ocean midwater diving where there's no reference can be very disorienting. I know that lots of the divers at the monument, the um, science divers and tech divers, they'll often have a buoy on a reel. And if they need to maintain a midwater stop, you know, maybe out of visual reference of the bottom, they shoot the buoy to the surface and then just hang. And it makes it much safer to maintain a constant depth for various decompression stops at, at different levels. Right, yeah. Yeah, when I, when I have done safety stops, I've also just keep looking at my depth gauge because otherwise I won't even notice like I've sunk I've sunk a little bit yeah so. well often there's a descent line or if people have come up the anchor line so there's a reference but without references it can be a little disorienting um during actually probably my most recent dive during the safety stop, um, we were actually so lucky and we were all there, you know, kind of looking at our, how much time we had remaining. And then I noticed this huge shadow pass by um, and it was actually a whale shark. So um, it was really a really special sight. Um, it was mm -hmm. funny because on that particular card for that dive site, like you know how some dive sites, they have like little pictures of the dive site that you're going to go to to show you the topography and stuff so um, they actually had a whale shark right in that spot that we were mm -hmm. doing our safety <laughs> safety stop so clever yeah it was like uh, summoning that <laughs> whale shark and our dive guy this was in uh, Palau she said during her many years of working there she hadn't seen that many whale sharks so it was pretty pretty great sight just happened during our safety stop yeah, very graceful. Yeah. Um, so we had a question. We are ascending, not descending. So we're ascending the ROVs and retrieving them. Um, so this is really towards the end of this dive. Um, and then another question about uh, when our next dive will be scheduled. Um, so we'll be transiting for uh, several hours and doing some mapping. So. Um, we can't say for sure exactly when, um, but it will be definitely soon. So um, stay tuned for that next dive at um, the next seamount. And in general, we're heading um, kind of more eastwards back towards port, and we'll be looking at some different seamounts on the way. Um, so there'll be some pretty, pretty great um, exploration footage as we continue this Ala Ala Moana Kaiuli expedition. I'd imagine some of that octopus footage would be highlights. Yeah, you definitely. Know, don't they post a highlight video clip? Yeah, so I think there's like a process of, um, like so many of us are recording highlights, right? Our data logger, I'm recording highlights. Um, you're also taking those really great still cam shots. Uh, so. Um, there's like a whole database, and um, I'm actually not trained <laughs> on it yet, but um, eventually we're going to uh, go through that and like pick out, out of the thousands and thousands of photos we have um, and videos, we'll pick out those and uh, make like albums or um, highlight reels to share them on social media. So definitely those octopi that we saw um, will be a part of that. Yeah, Sebastian, I don't know if you heard, but we saw, was it three or four Dumbo octopus on this dive? It was so awesome. Yeah, we saw one. Um, I think you guys saw three total, yeah? There was one we saw, like, really close. Um, okay, so like, it might have been the same one. 
Yeah. Okay, so you guys saw uh, like four. Possibly two. Plus right. so possibly four. Right, I guess. Yeah. Because you guys were the ones who saw it in the water column. Four. Yeah. Three. Three. Hmm? The double octopus. Yeah. Okay. So four. Yes. Uh, I think that if any of them are going to be a highlight, I do think it's the one you guys saw in the water column for sure. Because yeah, you guys got beautiful. both on um, Atlanta and on her. Oh, yeah, true. But watching them, that octopus get eaten was also kind of interesting, too. <laughs> I wish I saw that one. I was yeah. asleep for that one. <laughs> oh. That is. Yeah, what is that? Is it like a salt or? I'm guessing it's some kind of salt. Yeah, chain of salts. Two hundred and forty four meters coming up, I guess maybe fifteen minutes, a little yeah. less. We're ascending at twenty meters a minute. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Which is about the rate of the old diving ascent rate before they changed it. Really? Oh my Sixty God. feet a minute was the usual rate that for was many wow. years. I think now it's 30. Uh-huh. I feel like whenever I'm diving, I often get the watch beeping at me because <laughs> I'm going up like too fast. Yeah. But I don't even feel like I'm going up that fast, so. But yeah, that's pretty impressive, 20, 20 meters per, per minute. That would be like 60 feet mm -hmm. per minute, yeah. A little more. A little more than 60 feet. Yeah, I'm not a call for a deck. Not clear. Was that a jelly that just passed by, Sebastian? Like with really long tentacles? Um, that was a tinafore. Oh, tinafore! Wow. He's a very small guy. Hmm. If you're not familiar with tinafores, they're so-called um, comb jellies for any of our viewers tuning in. Um, the the way you write tinafore is actually with a C, so C-T-E-N-E-P-H-O-R-E, -E, tinafore. And those the teen refers to kind of these rows of cilia that they have um, to help capture things in the water to eat. out there. All right, Apashana is heading out. Thank you so much for all your biological knowledge and have fun sampling. <laughs> So what was the favorite thing you guys saw in your shift? Hmm, this particular shift or just oh, like let's all go the dive actually. The dives in general. 
because um, this particular shift, it was like a little bit different terrain and there wasn't as many corals, I feel like. And also we were just rushing to the waypoint, so we couldn't take too many zooms on things. But um, I think the Diamond Journal, I've always wanted to see Dumbo, so I was so amazed. Like every single time one popped up, so that was really awesome. Yeah. I like the one being eaten. The <laughs> one getting eaten, <laughs> yeah. Well, again, recycled. <laughs> recycled, used, you know, it's uh, very efficient. Put to best use. Uh, I think that we were falling behind because we were stopping going, wow, at every single giant oh, yeah. um, uh, Paragor uh, Paragorgian coral, the bubblegum corals, because we're seeing just back to back to back, just giant ones for us, yeah. like mm -hmm. Kirk sized. Whoa. Yeah, oh, they were yeah. gigantic. Yeah, Taylor Ann was also saying earlier that these are some of the biggest corals that she's ever seen um, on like this seamount in particular. Yeah, because like some of the bases for some of these ones were 20 centimeters across. Wow. So they were very much gigantic. Mm -hmm. And we think that um, there was actually three different color morphs because um, there were big white ones, big uh -huh. white ones with pink polyps and then there were big pink ones oh pink yeah polyps. that's true so um we collected what we think is might be a juvenile pure white one too so hopefully that can tell us whether or not they're different species the same species or just different species all overall wow yeah i did notice that um those like uh more white ones at the base and then the branches were pink but i didn't think that they would be a potentially different color morph, so that's really cool. In general, there was just like a lot of pink <laughs> on a this A lot dive. of pink, and like there was like, at one point, there was like a very dark pink, and then we had uh, at least like a bunch, like at least 12 larger um, mushroom anemone, mm. not mushroom anemones, mushroom corals, uh -huh. just all bunched together to look like one giant bush. Wow. And then we had um, two bright red brazingids on the ro same rock, and right across from it, one of those giant red anemones. Wow. So one shot we had was just like a whole bunch of like dark red. Wow. That was really striking. I definitely have to see that later, those photos. 125 meters. We're getting there. We're zooming. <laughs> We're in diving depths now. Are we talking like deep water coral diving depths or just like regular diving depths? Closed circuit rebreather diving depths. Got it. Have either of you done any like rebreathing diving at all? I've rebreathed. Oh yeah, wow. <laughs> How was it? It's fascinating. It's a completely different way of diving underwater. Is there a lot more to manage like with or um, like the gear so specialized, right? But do you actually have to handle that much of it while you're diving? Well, um, you know, there is there is an, an elevated level of risk. It's, it's The equipment is complex. The important measurement is for the system to know exactly how much oxygen you're, you have in the loop. And that depends on three oxygen sensors. The idea being if, if one goes bad, the two good ones outvote the bad mm, one. Okay. But you have to monitor that pretty closely. But um, Some redundancy in the system the, is good. Yeah, the, the, you know, there are other differences. Buoyancy is very different. I mean, when you inhale and exhale, you don't change your buoyancy underwater. And okay. you don't realize how much you're used to doing that with open circuit, blowing right. bubbles. Mm -hmm. And there are no bubbles, and it's yeah. silent. And so fish are surprised <laughs> that you're there. They'll bump into you. Really? They'll bump into your mass. Whoa. And they'll be very surprised because <laughs> they don't hear you coming. Wow, I thought they would sense with like the lateral line or something still, like the vibrations or something. Interesting. Every time I think of rebreathing diving, I think of, um, there's this video of, I believe it's Randy Kosaki um, diving in deep, deep water mesophotic reefs. And it puts like a decent amount of helium into their tanks oh, yeah, to make yeah. it work. <laughs> and you just see them like kind of getting very happy and uh, 
talking like Mickey Mouse because the hel helium trying to yeah. chase down and catch some mes mesophonic free fish. <laughs> it's a video <laughs> and it's just like always hilarious when I see it. Oh, that's really funny. I'll have to, you'll have to send that to us. Hi, y'all. I'm just going to jump in real quick. Sorry. Uh, we're approaching 50 meters, so if we can leave SPL open for operational talk now, that'd be great. Roger. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thanks so much. Goodbye, Appreciate everybody. you guys. All right, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Catch us on the next dive. Um, and check out our photos on our website and social media after. Deck nap. Go ahead, nap. Uh, the vehicles are at 50 meters. With that, we are finishing our safety and we'll get moving. Continue the recovery. Back deck bridge, uh, Charlie to recover. Copy that. Uh, control van, we will start bringing her up. Copy that. Deck, nav. Go ahead, nav. 
please slow down to 10 meters per minute on the winch. Copy that. Both vehicles are at the surface. Van copies.
Dispatch is on deck. Roger that.
control van back deck. We're bringing her alongside, she's about 20 feet off the stern. Copy that, we have visual. Secure.